Welcome to our extended segment of Florida This Week's Climate Special. We're going to continue our discussion with questions from the studio audience. And let's start with this uh, person right here. Welcome to the program. Uh, what's your question? Thank you. I'm Marlene Spalton from the Community Foundation Tampa Bay. And what I'd like to ask is, are there philanthropic strategies that you'd recommend uh, to Florida funders who want to address the climate change issues? Absolutely, that is such a fantastic question. Um, I would recommend thinking about it in, in two ways, three ways really. Um, you can donate to an organization and there are literally dozens of environmental nonprofits throughout the region who are doing uh, good work on climate, either uh, climate education uh, or they are doing habitat restoration. Uh, so all of these organizations uh, could use your help. Uh, so I, I think the first thing you might want to do for uh, organizations working on education is write your check to WEDU, of course. <laughs> and uh, in the Tampa Bay area, the um, uh, Tampa Bay Estuary Program would be a, a good one to look at. Uh, Tampa Bay Watch in the Sarasota area, uh, the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program and Sarasota Bay Watch. And of course, my organization, the Science and Environment Council, we are a collaborative group of 40 environmental uh, organizations in the region. Now, if you have, though, um, means, uh, I would encourage you to uh, look to your community foundations to set up a directed fund. Uh, that way, you can um, have impact long into the future uh, and uh, sort of hand select um, which organizations and which causes you want to support. I would say the last area that really needs some help uh, are our advocacy organizations. So these are those that really get out there, beat the drum, and talk to our policymakers. Uh, so there's Sierra Club, there's Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, conservative voices are important too. There's Republican.org. Uh, so I would say that, that all of those areas uh, are great ways to invest in our future. Thank you. Next question. And if, you, if you'd like to give us your name, that's fine. And if you'd like to be anonymous, that's fine too. Sure, I'm Erica Fulton. I just had a question about um, what, you, what the panel thinks about urban biomass projects and if they're viable at this time or if that's something in the future that we're going to be looking at. And when you say biomass, you're talking about a, a fuel source? What, what are you talking about when you say biomass? I'm talking about the, the Waste 360 initiative of, turning, of using urban biomass to turn all refuse into um, biometric materials. So uh, composting, just to clarify, are you talking about composting or composting are you talking about waste and bi waste, biosolids? Right, biosolids. I'm not familiar with the program that you're talking about, but uh, generally speaking, waste reduction uh, and finding um, uh, net carbon neutral sources of energy is very important. So uh, if you're turning your waste into a product that can produce energy, great. If you're tuning, turning your waste into a product that can be reused, great. Um, so that, that would be my comment on that, that I'm not familiar with the particulars of what you mentioned. Okay, okay thank you. Th there is a program in Sarasota Manatee to extract methane gas from garbage dumps. Mm -hmm. But does that put us in the, in the position of contributing to global warming because we're burning, burning methane gas? gas? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, there's, it's better to burn the gas than let it escape from a landfill, so there's that. Because it contributes less when it's burned? Yeah, methane is more potent than carbon dioxide. Uh, on the other hand, if you diverted some of that biomass uh, to a commercial scale composting, now you've got a product you can sell. Now you've got a viable business idea. Now you can um, encourage your community to use the compost instead of applying fertilizer, which was made using carbon uh, fossil fuel sources, uh, and then also contributes to our nitrogen pollution problem. Uh, so. It, nothing is ever simple. That's, that's I guess, is the, the, <laughs> the lesson there. Next question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Ciccarelli from Sarasota. And uh, first, I wanted to thank you all for the, for the presentation tonight and the show. And I want to pick up on the initial comments about the lack of urgency. And because of that, uh, 
I want to give a challenge to all of us. What is the feasibility of having Florida lead the United States in a Manhattan project for climate change? Yeah. So that we stop. <laughs> I'm not originally from this area, very few people are. But I'm, I'm tired of Florida being a late night joke about politics and ideology. Why can't we lead the nation in talking about green jobs? And, yeah, I, and Sean, why'd you go first? I heard a few comments about uh, uh, government uh, business partnership, but to pick up on that, um, we have to talk the language of the money uh, interests and corporations love tax breaks so why can't we get creative and have the federal government join with Florida to provide tax incentives to have companies who make real investments in jobs and technology have them pay less in federal tax it's an idea that I've never heard mentioned before We've got to get creative. Okay, let's Thanks go. very much for... Tony, thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. Sean? Tony, I would suggest that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, every good action has a plan. So about a dozen years ago, a group of activists in South Florida uh, formed the Southeast Florida Climate Compact, which was cited by former President Obama as being the most innovative effort to uh, look at climate change in America at the time. So fast forward a dozen years later, here in the Tampa Bay region, we have the 18th initiative of its kind, with government coming together with our business uh, our partners to develop a plan for implementation. I love your idea, why can't we do that in Florida? I think we can. I, we have testified before the state legislature this last session on the need for climate resiliency. I like to think the legislature heard us, they appropriated dollars. Mm -hmm. We've been very successful in uh, writing grants and getting uh, dollars awarded to us to develop further plans. I think we're well on the way, but we have a lot of work to do. All right, thank you. Sir. Um, yes, I, I'm thinking about all the uh, underdeveloped nations in the world and all the, the fully de developed nations. And I'm wondering if we can't get the developed nations or oh, a small responsibility to the smaller countries that have to start with coal, charcoal, and gas to get them started on a right path by maybe starting them with solar and wind instead of going through that whole protracted business of working themselves up to uh, uh, sustainable uh, like solar and, and, and wind. I would agree with you that uh, the developed nations do have an obligation to use our innovation, our universities, to really uh, jumpstart the type of technology that we're going to need at a price that works for developing nations so that they can sort of leapfrog the, the so-called right. dirty technologies. But you know, there, it, as long as there's that big cost differential, we talked about how electric cars would be great, but, but most uh, average uh, folks can't afford them, even more so in developing countries. We have to get that price differential down, and that's going to require R&D. We have the, the facilities, the brain power in our country, and I think sort of like how we got a, um, a vaccine developed in record time because we had that base and we had that uh, motivation uh, and we had the, the, the government to sort of back it up. I think that's but where, where this we need is to go. Where we need somebody from a developing nation to come, but, but wouldn't, would it be fair to say that during the debate about the Paris Climate Accords, that it was the developing nations like the Seychelles and some, some places like Bangladesh that were more concerned about enforcing the Par Paris Climate Accords than were some of the big nations that benefit from greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, that, that's the unfortunate truth of it, is, is that those that didn't cause the problem currently are, are experiencing very severe effects, the kind of effects that we won't expect in our communities for another uh, 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Hi, um, I'm Cheryl Hapke. I'm a coastal uh, uh, climate risk and resilient scientist. So this is, a, I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> my question kind of revolves around economics and what your thoughts are. Um, as I know, as you know, as a panel knows, um, with the latest IPCC forecasts, that this even if we went to net zero tomorrow, sea levels are going to continue to rise for millennia. And it's going to cost more and more money to be able to keep up with that. So what are the ways that we can, how can we get that much money to keep up with it? And what are your visions or ideas of when we're really going to have to accept the idea or how we're going to accept the idea of managed relocation? Well, I think from the uh, managed relocation from, um, from waterfront properties uh, is never a good thing to hear if you own that property. Uh, but if we look at the projections and we work with government uh, and we come up with a plan that is fair, uh, that doesn't devastate our economy and doesn't hurt the pocketbook of a property owner, uh, I think there's a way we could do that. But having that conversation and recognizing it and just looking at some of the facts, I mean, this time of year, particularly hurricane season, uh, we really need to be on our toes. And a, a, a quick plug to get your hurricane supplies if you haven't already. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, think, I think government has a responsibility to develop rules and regulations that are fair, and the private sector's involvement in the development of those rules, as Bamita referred to earlier, I think is critical. But I think with hard work and rolling up our sleeves, we can work together and come up with a solution. I mean, I agree wholeheartedly, and the bottom line is, everyone's gonna have to put money in, right? The business community's gonna have to put money in, individual property owners are gonna have to put money in, and municipalities and governments are gonna have to put money in. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Cheryl, thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Nancy Stevens. Um, Sean, you mentioned that um, go, to reduce greenhouse gases, we should all buy EVs. But if we're getting electricity from the power company that's using fossil fuels still, um, it, it's, it doesn't help as much as it could. So my question is, what is it going to take to get us to go to solar faster, get the, the power company, but also governments and businesses, um, what can they do to put solar panels on parking garages, on roofs, get it out there? I, I, could, I worked on a project uh, in Massachusetts, as you could probably tell, I'm a Massachusetts native. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's about a dozen years ago now, we rebuilt a transit uh, bus hub, and it was about 50,000 square feet. It was a large building. And we, we, as part of the deal, and this was under the uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act back uh, when President Obama's administration, and that had bipartisan support, I might add, we, we made the bus company build uh, solar power, solar panels onto the rooftop of that structure. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the deal to get federal money. So if government can, without making it sound like attach more strings, but kind of work with, with folks, that if you're going to use federal money, which is all of ours, then you have a responsibility to work toward helping us uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and reliance on f fossil fuel and solar panels is certainly a one way that we can help and take that small step in the right direction. What, was it a win-win that is that their electric bill went down and, and they were reducing their emissions too? Absolutely, it certainly was. Thank you. Good evening, Dwayne Virgit with Tampa Bay Watch, and thank you. This is obviously something in our wheelhouse that we, we address every day. Um, so my question to the panel is, as we're taking a look at, uh, we talked about different shorelines, we talked about sea rise, we're taking a look at sea walls. Um, one of the big alternatives is living shorelines. And I wanted to get your thoughts on the feasibility of approaching that from a legislative perspective. Whereas as part of the construction bills and starting the requirements for developers that they start taking a look at incorporating that as a way to protect the shorelines and uh, take a look at our future. And Dwayne, before you go, uh, what do you think of sea walls? Well, I think there's a better way. I think there's definitely a better way. We're big fans of living shorelines. Take that one, Rob. And, uh, we recently at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council looked at three communities in Tampa Bay. We looked at a, we call it inland basin in, in the city of Tampa adjacent to Bush Gardens. That was a flood prone area, chronic flooding. Mm -hmm. Uh, we then looked at uh, the city of Oldsma, at R.E. Olds Park, right on the shores of Tampa Bay. And then we also looked at St. Pete Beach, a barrier island. The common denominator on all of those items is flooding. But they all have very different characteristics. So we held a three-day charrette in each of those three communities. We invited our Dutch friends from the Netherlands through the consulate of the Netherlands in Miami to come and help us with their expertise. And we developed, we call the project Resilient Ready, 
funded by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection on a successful grant that we had written. And we developed a plan that will help get each one of those communities specific to the area referenced, uh, put them in a position to help write their own grant to implement a solution to reduce the flooding problem in each of those areas. Thank you. Sean, Sean, should we look at green space as flood protection? That is, should we expand the amount of green space Absolutely. that we have in the Bay Area? And, and those old shopping malls that are being abandoned right now, that are no longer being used, should we tear up that concrete? Uh, that's an option, certainly, but I think we certainly should think about green space. And if I, if I could talk specifically about RE Olds Park and Oldsma, uh, on a sunny day uh, with not a high tide and no storm um, recently, uh, uh, frequently, uh, it's a beautiful park. You take your kids, you can ride the swing set, have a picnic, it's beautiful. But during uh, Tropical Storm Edda, however, really the no name storm, if you'll not really a hurricane, it had a significant impact. RE Olds Park was flooded, as were some of the low lying structures that date back to the 50s right across the street, uh, as well as Madeira Beach was really affected by Hurricane Etta, not from the waterfront from the Gulf, but really from the inland water and Boca Siega Bay, where it rose up to two feet. And if, I remember Rob driving through that neighborhood in Madeira Beach and the contents of folks' house were out in their front lawn. Mm -hmm. So if we expand the amount of green space, we're providing some protection against flood, That's flooding. Right. Good evening and thank you. I'm Carol Camisa with the Hillsborough County League of Women Voters. Um, my concern is about the people that we're leaving behind. Um, on the one hand, I'm very concerned about young people. Um, some of them, uh, Greta uh, Thunberg, uh, excuse me, is um, you know a real leader, and, there, and we, we can see some energy from young people. But we also see a lot of discouragement. And I think the lack, as was pointed out earlier, of seriousness uh, and urgency with which we have addressed this has, has left behind young people in a lot of ways. I'm also concerned about vulnerable populations. Um, I think people with expensive properties on the coast are going to figure out what they're going to do and they're going to manage. But we're going to start to see, as we are in other places in the world, climate refugees. Um, and, and I'm very concerned about uh, vulnerable communities and poor people. I just wondered your comments on that. Who wants to take it? Demetra, you want to start? Yeah, so I mean, I think that that's a very real uh, issue. And I think we've seen climate refugees already. I mean, in many ways, that's what happened to a lot of the New Orleans residents and how they ended up in other cities, Houston, Atlanta, you know, so on and so forth. I think from my perspective, for the young people, it's gonna kinda of sound cliche, but I think it's important. Everything that we're talking about right now, we can't get done without our policy makers, right? So we can't get people to be so apathetic that they're not voting, right? Because like that, it sounds basic, but it's like the best thing that we can do. And so that you get leaders in there that share our energy around this. And, and I think right now what's happening is people get discouraged and then they start thinking that their vote doesn't matter. But Florida of all places, I think if you live in any state, you know, like we see election swing with 29,000, you know, votes here. So I just think making sure that everybody has, that we're all being champions within our own respective communities to, to, get, to get that excitement up, if that makes sense. That each, each and every one of us can make a difference, if that makes sense. The, the poll I cited at the beginning of the program says that young people are very concerned about this issue, but how do we prevent them from getting discouraged, as Carol said? I think we can frame this as an opportunity. Uh, we uh, don't have to be nihilistic about it. We can uh, talk about how what we need to do, we can do. It's possible. We'll find our way out of this. Uh, and, but we need their help. They are going to be the engineers of tomorrow. There are uh, bill billions of dollars of um, um, revenue available to the person who figures all of these solutions out. So that seems to be a, a great motivator uh, for the youth to uh, stick with their STEM and, and uh, help us figure this out. So we're almost at the end of the show, but Carol, thank you. Uh, let, let me just ask the three of you. Uh, I always ask something at the very end of the show. Oh, we've got one more question. Sir, go ahead. Hi, my name is Paco Amram. I'm an environmental engineer and a lead AP. Uh, I specialize in a different field, but I'm super interested in this topic. I just want to throw out a few uh, burning concerns I have about this issue. Whatever thoughts you have about it, I'd love to hear about it. One is the uh, we can't electrify everything right away because the power grid's not ready for it, be overloaded. Um, related to that, a TED talk I saw recently explained how the total life cycle carbon, 
cost, so to speak, or carbon footprint of electric cars is actually more than a hybrid until many, many, many years out. So hybrids may be a better initial solution and you know, alleviate some of that load on the grid in the transition. Um, another topic is, you know, we could have tropical storms and we could have three days of cloudy weather where solar, my solar system will produce 10 to 30% of its capacity during those days. So that's gonna be another challenge with renewables versus say nuclear or just a lot more solar and, and long-term storage. Uh, lastly is the, the depopulation, or I forget what you called it, um, scaling back populations from the coast. If we do get this massive sea level rise and intrusion of the sea level, we're gonna have a, a really horrendous coastline with uh, basically, uh, you know, annihilated, flooded homes. So there's, is there, do these plans include something for the deconstruction of those areas so that the abandoned homes don't just remain and become a, a polluted coastline? Thank you very much. That's for a your good question. Thank you, Paco. That, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of things. I know we're, we're running low on time. So uh, yeah, I think there needs to be bonding, uh, at some point, bonding of, of coastal structures so that when it comes time to abandon, they're not just left there, that there is a fund in order to deconstruct and take away that pollution. Uh, with regard to uh, where we're going to get our energy, solar is not the only solution. We need all of the above. Biofuels uh, that are uh, carbon neutral can be an are going to have to be an important uh, type of fuel because uh, we have airplanes that we want to keep in the sky and tankers that we want crossing oceans. Uh, so um, nuclear also has to be on the table in my opinion, uh, but not the old way. You know, we need, we need uh, innovative solutions to some of the problems that plagued us um, 40 years ago. Let me go around the table just as a, as a last moment here. What didn't we talk about that you would like to talk about? And l let me just say what I'd like to talk about is I interviewed a Swedish or, or a Swiss scientist a few years ago who wrote an article for Science who said that if we plant a trillion trees, that would be a low-tech way to deal with the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But what, what didn't we talk about? that you would like to talk about? What, what issue would you like to raise, Sean? Just uh, briefly discussed by a young lady who was at the mic a moment ago, and that's vulnerable populations who live in houses that are most vulnerable. We, uh, Rob, completed a study recently with assistance from J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation where we looked at structures in the Tampa Bay region in, uh, in environmental justice neighborhoods. And we found that, uh, not really surprisingly, but the folks who have the least means are the most vulnerable. And that, in my opinion, is where government has a responsibility to help. Uh, and I think uh, as long as we can continue, continue to stress that factor, uh, we'll, there will be an improvement. But we can't ignore it. We have a responsibility as humankind and as Americans to help those uh, who, who have the least among us. Uh, and now the science is proving that uh, we've identified areas where that, where it, particularly in this area where we know we're vulnerable to extreme weather, that we just have a responsibility to help one another. Okay. Jennifer, you want to take it? Sure, I'd, I'd just like to continue my positive tone here. Um, I feel like everyone, absolutely everyone, has a role to play and there's something you can do right now. Whether you're uh, interested in energy or food or waste reduction or protecting uh, nature um, or um, protecting water quality, there's something related to climate change in all of that. And if I could just plug, Science and Environment Council just launched a toolkit that includes all of that, steps, how to volunteer, events, all the details and resources you need, greenlivingtoolkit.org. All right, Pavitra? Yeah, my thoughts would be, you know, we've talked a lot this uh, evening about, you know, government's roles, business role, and I would just say we all, this is all of our responsibility, it's not, one or the other, and we need everybody working in concert together, business, government, and community in order to address this issue. All right, well, thank you all for a great discussion. Thank you. I really thank appreciate you. it. Well, that concludes our special on climate change. Thank you again to our panelists and our studio audience, and from all of us here at WEDU, thank you for joining us. This was great, thank you. Thank you.